welcome to our on time start in 2016. Uh, I'm going to not make any announcements and just launch right into things because well, our speakers have requested that we can be short. Uh, we have uh, Mary Jackman and Kimberly Shaman from UC Davis, who uh, we, uh, I met when they came to our uh, mini conference that Ron organized on inequality, and they said they were working on this exact topic, and I said, great, come to the brown bag. So here they are. Welcome from UC Davis. We look forward to hearing about the toll of inequality, racial inequality, and excess death in the U.S. over the last century. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I would just like to mention, first of all, thank you for giving us this forum to present our work in this beautiful room, lovely old building. Um, uh, and we'd also like to mention at the outset that an awful lot of people gave us really good feedback and help earlier on in this project, and we're particularly grateful to Sam Preston and Douglas Eubank, who are just incredibly knowledgeable about black mortality in the U.S., and they gave us really a huge amount of help at the beginning. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just talk for a few minutes about what motivated us to do this study, um, and then Kim will um, go through our data and results. So um, let's start right at the beginning, which is that there's this um, huge mortality gap that persisted throughout the 20th century um, between whites and blacks in the US. Um, and you know, when you look at it, I'm gonna just, okay, so here we have a figure that shows the estimated life expectancy um, at birth for African Americans and whites by sex across the 20th century. Um, and when you start at the beginning of the 20th century, um, oh, and I should mention the data we're using here, most of the data that these estimates are based on um, are pretty standard, the company's standard sources, but when you're talking about the first few decades of the 20th century until the DRA had complete coverage of the US, the raw data are um, not considered to be very reliable. So we um, made some adjustments to those data based on UBAC's research to get um, more accurate mortality figures um, for blacks and whites. Um, so when you look at the first five years of the 20th century, um, the estimated life expectancy for, for black men and women was 37 and 38 years respectively. And it's pretty bloody crappy, um, even, for 19, even for the first five years of the 20th century. And um, it's a full 14 years behind the, expected life, the life expectancy of whites. Um, so it's a massive gap. So over the 20th century, like everybody's life expectancy went up. Um, uh, including for blacks, but then the gap in life expectancy also did narrow over the 20th century, but the improvements in narrowing that gap were kind of choppy over the century, um, especially for black men, but actually for both sexes. Um, so this figure just concentrates on the, um, what the, um, the estimated racial difference in life expectancy was at birth um, by sex, and the red line is for um, females and the blue line for males. Um, so what you can see right away is that there was a huge drop in, um, in the uh, racial mortality gap from 1935 to 1950 after the introduction of the Social Security Act. And there were also a number of public health measures that went into effect in the 20s and 30s that had a big impact. Um, introduction of sanitary water and sewage systems, um, refrigerated milk, and some pretty rudimentary public health programs. Um, so they conquered the infectious diseases that were the main culprit in causing the um, mortality gap um, in the early part of the century. Um, but in the second half of the century, you don't have that same kind of anything of that magnitude happening in the second half of the century. So the gains between 1935 and 1950 um, in narrowing that gap kind of almost stalled out, certainly for black men. Um, and then for black women, they continued to see sort of modest declines for the rest of the century. But by the time you get to the end of the century, um, there's still a significant mortality gap, um, or life expectancy gap, between um, uh, blacks and whites. So it's a little bit over seven years um, for black men and a little over five years for black women. And the only other thing I want to mention about this data is that you can't miss, is that for most of the century, the life expectancy, uh, the racial life expectancy gap was actually worse for black women than it was for black men. The end of the century, black men kind of it got worse for them, but for most of the century, it was actually um, females who were more adversely affected. Um, okay, so we all know that um, mortality rates are widely recognised by both national and international agencies to so monitor populations. They're widely recognised as a critical indicator of population well-being. Um, 
So that means that when we find a gulf in mortality rates um, between two groups within the same political state, um, it's, it tells us a hell of a lot about disparate conditions of life for those two groups, and then by inference, since they're within the same political state, um, it tells you they're getting very different allocations of resources from that state. And so uh, we also know that within populations, the empirical relationship um, between socioeconomic standing and health and mortality um, you know, it's long been identified as a very stable feature of populations. Um, and in the past two decades especially, there's been just an absolute outpouring of research, um, looking into all the environmental and social and uh, economic sources of that um, relationship. Um, and since race and socioeconomic well-being have been really intimately connected right from the get-go, from when the first Africans were brought here in the early 1600s for the purpose of doing servile labor for whites, um, it means that then by default, um, blacks are going to be having um, poorer health outcomes and higher mortality um, than whites. So most of, it's important to remember that most of these deaths um, were not deliberately sought by whites. Their purpose was to bring blacks in to exploit them, not to kill them. Um, but the deaths all happened just as surely as if they had been deliberately planned. Um, but they happened as an incidental fallout from the day-to-day -day, um, inequality and discrimination that were that were themselves produced by White's primary goal, which was to exploit and control blacks. And um, in recent, in the last, um, I would say in the last five to ten years especially, sociologists of health um, have been focused increasingly on this uh, relationship between um, race in the United States and health outcomes and, and death. Um, and the, um, it's now being proposed that um, by a number of scholars that race should be seen as a fundamental cause um, of health outcomes and mortality in the United States. Um, okay, so when we have such large disparities um, between the mortality rates of whites and blacks, you can't help but wonder like, how many excess deaths there must have been among blacks to produce these massive differences. So in other words, how many premature deaths occurred in the black population that would not have occurred if they'd, had, if they'd been lucky enough to have the same mortality rates as whites? Um, and this question, we have to answer this question in order to assess the human death toll that was a result of a century of racial discrimination and inequality. Okay, so what exactly do we mean by excess deaths? Because I think sometimes um, there can be some confusion about this. Um, so excess deaths refer to the mortality um, above what would be expected under the counterfactual condition of um, racial equality and mortality. It's as simple as that. So that counterfactual, we don't posit that as some sort of realistic alternative ideation of how things might have suddenly changed in 1900 and had an instant effect on um, mortality figures in the US. It's actually, it's only, we're only using it as a benchmark against which to measure the depth of the inequality and the gap. And um, just as the Gini index uses, you know, an abstract measure, takes the measure of income equality in order to assess the depth of the inequality in a population. Um, so excess deaths in a deprived group are attributable to the disparate conditions experienced by the two groups. The number of excess deaths depends on the magnitude and duration of the differential in conditions, as well as the size of the affected population. Excess deaths are premature deaths that would not have occurred during a discrete period of time if the resources that affect mortality had been equal across groups. And then finally, because excess deaths are counted in discrete time periods. Um, they can be compared across different points in the century, and they can also, more importantly, be added um, across the century to give us a cumulative count of the overall death toll from 1900 to 2000 that resulted from the um, uh, racial inequality. Now, if the excess deaths among blacks had resulted from a genocidal campaign, a pogrom, or a natural disaster, they would announce themselves very loudly to the world, and there would be just an automatic reflex response. Oh my God, we've got to go out and count how many people died as a result of that. But the death toll from a century of racial discrimination and inequality has actually slipped under the radar. Um, and the carefully, well, even though this, the racial mortality gap has been so carefully documented throughout the century, um, it's just kind of rested. Those figures have just rested there as a set of abstract statistics that are disconnected from the dreary reality of lives severed and communities disrupted socially and economically by excessive deaths. So most of the excess deaths do not draw attention to themselves because they happen quietly 
one by one, seemingly disconnected. It's um, yeah, with multiple specific causes and many lagged effects and many different actors participating. Um, so um, it means that what happened, the effect is that because of all these um, different negative um, events in blacks lives as a result of racial inequality, that this kind of is a sort of a continuing cumulative impact on their bodies as they, as they go through the lifespan. And um, blacks are thought to actually age, their bodies are thought to age uh, more rapidly than, um, than, than whites' bodies. So now we all know that um, everyone who is born has to die sometime. Um, but the timing of those deaths is, of course, critical. Um, it's better to die when you are 90 than when you are 20, or even 30, 40, or 50. All of us would prefer all other things equal to live a longer life than, than, rather than a shorter one. And apart from you and your personal <laughs> survival, it's also better for your family and your community um, if um, you don't die prematurely, because there are all kinds of um, um, social and economic, uh, negative social and economic effects that ripple out from every premature death um, that occurs and cause you know, huge uh, social and economic upheavals. Um, and when blacks are dying, when more blacks are dying prematurely, um, that means there'll be more black deaths um, in any given period of time. Um, and these will make these social and economic upheavals um, more pervasive and widespread in the black community than in the white community. Could you just say a word about why yeah. this unit of excess deaths is the one we should be interested in and not, say, lost years of life or the original graph, differences in life expectancy? Um, well, the thing about life, you know, life expectancy, well, <laughs> if you look at death, if you look at mortality rates, that's a nice neat and tidy way to summarize it. It's not subject to the size of the population. But, but I think for, but we want people to grasp in human terms what this means, like how many extra people died, so that people can be translated into something that you can um, see was a, a result. Whereas, you know, um, life expectancy certainly does a better job of that. I think it conveys, it's got more of a human, um, it conveys more of a human element. Um, but discounting the excess deaths, um, people are dying more frequently at any point in time, so that has huge impact on the community, as well as on the poor individuals that die. Okay, so we feel we need to, I think people are having trouble grasping just what the human impact was. Um, okay, um, so there have actually been a few other studies of excess African American deaths over the 20th century. Um, they all concentrate on the period after 1940. Um, and um, these, these studies do suggest a high death toll. Um, but there are no analyses prior to 1940 because of concerns, I'm sure, about the DRA data um, during that period. Um, but it's very unfortunate to leave that period out because that's when blacks' economic welfare was at its absolute worst. Um, and it's also when the life expectancy gap was also at its worst. Um, and then um, for the period after 1940, different studies use different age groups, they use different methods to estimate the excess deaths and so on. So that you can try to put them all together as a body of research to try to make any kind of overall comprehensive assessment. You really can't. Um, so um, we really feel that you do need to do a kind of systematic account of the excess deaths, um, the excess deaths among African Americans over the entire 20th century, in order to provide summary testimony in human terms. Um, of two different things. First, the divergent standards of living and quality of life that were dished out by race in the United States. Um, and second, to, um, to really grasp um, the cost that was borne by African Americans um, for living in a regime of racial inequality. Okay, and then finally, um, the last reason that we were interested in, in um, getting, a, getting a grip on these excess deaths um, is that the excess deaths are also important because they affect the rate of population growth <coughs> as well as the demographic composition of a population. Um, and these, in turn, have significant political and economic ramifications. <coughs> so on the political side, dominant groups in general um, prefer to outnumber um, the groups that they are trying to subordinate. It just, um, they just feel more at ease when that's the case because it makes the business of control a little bit less daunting. And American whites have been no exception to that general rule. Um, so, um, one example for the Amer American whites, so the imperative um, uh, to exploit and control African Americans that resulted from um, 
uh, sorry, the imperative to exploit and control African Americans that led to discriminatory domestic um, racial policies and practices also um, motivated um, American governments to introduce legislation after legislation that was also discriminatory and that was clearly geared towards um, trying to um, reduce um, the growth of the black population. Um, um, however, it turns out that controlling um, the size of subordinated populations isn't necessarily as straightforward as sort of dominant groups might like it to be. Um, populations that are poor have higher death rates, but then that means they're also much more likely to have higher birth rates. Um, so as dominants seek to subordinate another group, they withhold resources from that group. That's what it's all about, like more for me, less for you. Um, but this results inevitably in a higher death rate in the subordinate group, um, and then also a higher birth rate. So repeatedly it's been observed that as populations experience economic advancement, they transition to a regime where death rates go down, and as survival becomes more, you know, um, more certain, birth rates also tend to decline. So this means that as dominants assert themselves over subordinates, um, subordinates get pushed into a demographic regime of high deaths and high births, which perversely may lead to more rapid population growth in the subordinate group than in the dominant group, which is definitely not the desired outcome from the dominant group's point of view. Um, then it also means that the demographic composition of economically deprived subordinated groups is more likely to have a shortage of stable economic providers and too many economic dependents, which is a crushing combination with very bad implications for the economic vitality and economic growth of that group. Okay, so now Ken's going to go through our data and results. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to tell you um, what we did and then what we found. Okay, so um, so we estimate this number of excess deaths, of which we're labeling here E, um, among African Americans <coughs> in each discrete five-year um, period between 1900 and 2000. So that is, we're estimating the number of African American deaths that would have been avoided in each of those five-year intervals um, had the survival rates of blacks been equal to those of, of whites by comparing the population at the end of each five, each discrete five-year period, um, um, the, the estimated population there based on the black survival rates, that's this one, compared to what that estimated population size would have been if, the, if blacks had been able to enjoy the lower um, mortality rates that whites enjoyed. And so we're doing this using the, um, the, the component method of population projection, just doing these five-year interval, um, intervals, aging the population forward, um, using the observed um, birth rates for African Americans and the observed um, mortality counts for African Americans in each of these time periods, um, but using these two different, um, two different sources of mortality or two different estimates of mortality rates, that which is, um, was actually experienced by blacks, those, those reported um, death rates, and that which was experienced by whites. So we're, that's how we're doing this. Um, we also use, a uh, we do a couple of different things to test the reliability of this, recognizing that the data that we're using is, is um, itself has some, some error built into it. Um, and there's a, we have quite an appendix, so if you have questions about that, we can come back to that at, um, during the Q&A. All right, so to do this, we need sources of data. Um, we, let's go for first equation. Uh, if, uh, if, I, if I'm missing, in year, in 1980, am, am I missing again in 1985 or 1990? Or am I, is no. each person just yeah. counted no. once? Each person just, just counted once. once. Each person, person they can once. only disappear once um, it, because, they, because we have these five-year intervals. And this is one of the things about the excess death count. It is something that can be added across time. We're doing it within each interval, but because the estimates are within those discrete intervals, we can then go ahead and count up across the century how many excess deaths actually occurred. Is it possible? It, it doesn't, the, the equation doesn't look like that. The equation looks like the population, we just look at the differences of the two population sizes, and it would just be counted each time. But it's not it's because it's we restart with the observed average. population at each start of each five-year period. We start with the observed African-American population at the start of each five-year period. We restart this. Okay. We're not doing a population, at the end, I'm going to show you population projections, allowing it to roll forward. And that would, in, that would include, and I'll get to that, the, both the direct effect and the indirect effect of, of mortality. Okay, so we'll get to that. All right. Thank you. It's a common question, though. I'm glad to ask. <laughs> okay, so we have lots of sources of data. Um, 
So we wanted to do this for the full, um, the full century. Um, so as we all know, historical sources of data have some issues with them, reliability issues. These issues often hit, or they're, they're more impactful on data for African American, the African American population, and definitely for the earlier part of the century. Now there's a really wonderful tradition in demography of looking at these sources of data, the recorded data, and developing estimates and adjustments and doing all sorts of stuff to figure out what is the most reliable estimates that we have. Comparing those rates against historical records and things like that. So we have been, we have used every single um, source of data that we can that is considered to be those most reliable sources of adjusted data. So we use whatever we can. Um, and so we are crediting all of those sources. But we also um, wanted to um, look at the early part of the century. So prior um, data prior to 1935 was based on an incomplete death registration area. You probably all know that. Um, and so this has really limited the attention that has been paid to that very critical part um, period of U.S. history, a period when racial inequality was particularly significant. And so this is the, um, the questions about the data has limited our scholarly attention to that time period. So we really wanted to look at that time period, so we actually used a number of different sources, most notably Doug Eubank and Sam Preston's work trying to assess the, um, and, and develop adjustments for particular data sources during that early, those early century, or decades of the 20th century. We, we um, estimate adjusted um, mortality rates for both blacks and whites for that period, um, using both of the adjustments that, Pres that um, Preston and um, Haynes and then Eubank um, presented. Um, and then we looked at both of those sources of adjusted data. Ultimately, we end up using the ones based on Douglas Eubank's adjustments because those appear to be the most consistent with the historical record and the um, most, the least likely to overstate the racial gaps in um, in mortality. So those are the those are the sources of data. So this might be the right time to ask just two questions. One is uh, a brief reminder about the Great Migration, the time period mm -hmm. that, that applied to, because. Um, when you talk about the lie tables, the thing that came to mind is 1940 onwards, I believe, the predominance at the state level by white and black. And I wonder if you took that into consideration. So for 1940 onwards, we're actually using Irma Elo's estimates that were um, that are considered to the most reliable for that. But if there's questions about that data and you know of other sources, I'd love to hear about it. Well, I just mean because if there was a lot of movement, um, and I mean, that, if that coincides right. with this enormous decrease in the Black-white gap, right. life expectancy. Maybe, maybe due to the Great Migration, you could have some problems by comparing these aggregate life tables where many more blacks are living in the South, where life expectancy is very different. Than but the historical record, if we actually go back and look at the evidence of what the living conditions were in both of these areas, I would argue that most the record, and Mary knows yeah. this, this literature a lot better than I do, but the record is that it's pretty bad in both of those locations, and that it didn't actually improve, start to improve, and that actually in the rural areas it might have been a little bit better, a better place to live, because of the lack of sanitation and lack of refrigeration and in the, in the city. So at least in the rural areas, if you're drinking milk, you might be getting it from the cow, rather than in the city, you're actually relying on the, it being delivered from who knows where, and lack of refrigeration means that it's affecting especially child's health outcomes and child's um, health um, very significantly during that time period. Yeah, so it's a definitely a, a question. Let me show you what we're finding, and then we could. We'd love. To, I'd love to be able to put some bands around this. We have so many different estimates based on different data sets. I'm going to present just some of those, but it could be that given the questions, we should present a lot more of those. I'm also wondering what. Um, the appropriateness of the population accounting equation. Um, given the literature on sort of passing as white, especially in the 1940s, are you, there's not that many people, true, but also true, but it would suggest that people would be shifting from the African-American category to the white category, and given that your rates are being estimated on how many people Sort of mortality rates. Yeah. From the proportion of people, the proportion of people actually doing that, I think, does not lead to a significant questioning of the reliability of those data. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Um, do I need to say anything more about this? Okay, so let me see, show you what we find. Okay, so I'm going to walk through this this graph, and then I know it's going to the, the numbers that it will appear are going to be too small. So I'll summarize what we're finding. Okay, so. This figure um, presents the total number of deaths that occurred amongst African, um, ever born African Americans aged 0 to 79. I should also mention that we do all the analyses um, 
for age, age and sex specific categories, okay? Age, um, sex, and race specific categories. All right, so here's the, the um, uh, total number of uh, observed deaths to ever born African Americans aged 0 to 79. And then this, these is the, this is the uh, estimated number of deaths to ever born African Americans that we would have seen had the um, blacks experienced the um, mortality rates of whites. So then, of course, the gap between the heights of these two bars gives us the number of excess deaths. And so that's what we have here in these brackets. And then we also present, too small for you to see, so I'll summarize. But, um, but um, we also present the percentage of all deaths that were in excess um, as a way of sort of summarizing the magnitude of, of the number of excess deaths. OK, so we can see basically that the, the number of excess deaths are its greatest here in the early part of the century, then it sort of narrows, and then it pops back up in the last decade of the 20th century. So during that first part, the first decades of the um, 20th century, um, we see that the, the count, the total count of excess deaths were greatest during these first three decades of the century. They ranged from just under 450,000 in each five year um, interval to just under four, 514,000 and accounted for between 42% and almost 50% of all deaths. So almost 40, between 42 and 50% of all deaths were excess during this time period. From 1935 to, 19, to the 1990, the count of excess deaths narrows. It goes down to between 260,000 to about 390,000. And during this time period, the percentage of all deaths which are excess it doesn't reach, um, it's under 40. It's, uh, it's under 40 for all those time periods. But the quantity of excess death then jumps back up again at the end of the century in the 1990s to equal the magnitude both in count and also in percentage of all deaths um, to African Americans that we experienced in the early part of the century. This table then, um, the next table here, summarizes that cumulative count of excess deaths. So just as we might count up the number of individuals lost due to genocide, or we've attempted to count up the number of, um, of uh, females who are lost due to social and cultural norms about uh, for um, sex preference, things like that. We're counting up the number of African Americans who are missing from the population. And remember, this is the number of those who were ever born who are actually who died prematurely because of this gap, um, persistent gap in mortality rates. So uh, what we find is that by the middle of the century, about 4.3 million African Americans were um, missing from the population or, or died prematurely. Um, our, our, that is our count of excess deaths. And by the end of the century, 7.7, 7, um, almost 7.4 million African Americans are um, lost due to um, excess death. Um, over the century, the um, excess death, these excess deaths, accounted for no, no less than 40% and as much as 45.3% of all deaths th throughout the century. So that's the overall finding. Then now we also find this, the impact of excess death, as Mary alluded to in the introductory section, the impact of excess death is definitely going to be different by, for males and females because the racial gap in mortality varied by gender throughout the century. Just, just, just focus on one of these numbers. Just like, so the 7.7 sure. .7 million, does that mean there would be 7.7 .7 million more blacks in the 2000 census? Tell us what it does mean. It means that if we if we look at every five year period or every decade, then we have a certain number of individuals who would have been alive at the end of that decade had they experienced the, the um, same mortality rates as whites. So we're counting it up for each decade. Of course, people don't tend to live for a full century. So this is not a, a, a count at the end of the century in terms of an actual population count. This is the count of people who were missing throughout the century because of this racial gap in mortality. Okay. And then the other 41 percent, does that mean that 59 percent of blacks did not experience differential mortality, that they died at the time we would have expected had they had white mortality? How do we interpret the No, that's, that's the, the, of all the deaths, of all the deaths throughout the century, 49% or for, for each of these, so for the end of the century, the end yeah. of the century, 41% of all deaths among African Americans were excess that were due to the racial mortality gap. And the 59%, the, the yeah, 100% minus that, is what? Those are people well, well, that, they, that's what happened. would have happened had they enjoyed those low mortality rates anyways. But, but here, 
But excess means they died earlier than they should have died. Yes, yes. And it could be they died by one day earlier, right. one right. month earlier, five years earlier. Right, right. right. Okay. Excess means, in that sense, it's early death. Yes, yes. Well, it also adds up to more deaths. Because if more people are dying younger, there's going to be more deaths. Yeah. No, but I just, just, just clarify that 41% yeah. is yeah. people who died earlier than you would have expected. I think that the number of the demographers in the room are, are bothered by counting the scheme. You thought a little about this, but you went over the equations rather quickly. Is it not true <coughs> that if you take the deaths that were and you add the, the, the excess deaths to those deaths, then you have, and some over the century, then you have many more deaths? than there were births. No, the excess deaths not occurred. They occurred. They occurred. They would not have. We're not adding deaths that didn't occur. We are taking deaths that did occur and classifying them as those that would not have occurred if mortality rates were lower. But everyone who is born dies. Yes. 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 So That's when you die. Right. Can you explain why this is a double counting? Because it's within, it's so funny that this happens every time, because I think <laughs> demographers should get this. It's a discrete time period. So if, um, okay, so if I, if I were to drop dead now, um, I'm gone. I died, right? Um, but say I had just lived uh, another hour longer, I might come to the next talk in this room so I can show up in the room then. So all I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I drop dead now. I can't show up then, but what if? I had lived a little bit longer, I can show up then. So we're not adding any deaths that didn't already happen. Those individual African Americans, they died early. They're gone. So they don't show up at the base at the, in the next five year interval. They died prematurely. So they died between 1900 and 1905. I count them as an excess death. It's still a death. Then the, the next five year period, they're not in my base population. They don't reappear in the actual population that then I age forward with both the whites' um, death rates and the blacks' death rates. So I so can't this be double measure counting. can be computed. Suppose uh, sometimes white death rates were higher, sometimes white death but rates not. were lower. You have a series of pluses and minuses. You're saying there's an accounting. But white death rates never were higher in the 20th century. That's the thing. So some of these terms can be mild. Excess deaths, in your definition, right. can be plus or minus. Oh, yes. Theoretically. What's Theoretically, it? but it's given theory. the situation in the United States for African American no, right. versus white, yes. Right. yes. Yes. It yes. 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 Right. measure, right. but this is a exactly. room full of demographers, and we'd like to right. understand the, and this is one of the theory reasons. of the measure. So these right. can be positive or negative. Absolutely. Right? Theoretically, yes. And what is it that sums to what in the total accounting? The number of deaths that did occur that would not have had the death rates been lower for African Americans. Had the death rates been equal to whites. Been equal to whites. So it's the difference well, of the fallout of the racial mortality gap. The negatives subtract from the positives? Yes, because yeah. we're doing the accounting by age and by um, by minute age age differences. So if you if you find that in a particular um, age range for, for a particular sex, that the African Americans' death rates were actually lower than whites, then that would actually detract from the the count of excess deaths. So it is a net effect. It is a net effect. So this is a percentage basis of something that can be positive. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to call them what you call excess deaths, as was Paul suggested? If you call them early deaths, does this make does this make more sense? Not to me. Yeah. yeah. So we can call them early deaths. deaths. I think in some ways this is a sociological analysis as well, and that calling them early deaths, it it makes it sound less terminal, less detrimental. No. These people. The death word does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does carry yeah. that negative kind of thing. really were extra deaths yeah. happening in the black yeah. community yeah. because people were dying younger. That's just. Well, this is more deaths happening right? all the time. It's making all more sense to me. Age, these are early deaths. Yeah. Yeah. Like early deaths. But if they're an early death, they still can't be. So if you see it, yeah. see that as a way of saying once, that so then I'm not death. really <laughs> counting it double, then fine, I'll call them early deaths. But it's that's a labeling change, but not a. Um, the counting is the same. The numbers are the same. 
I think that whoever asked does this does does one of these show who doesn't show up in the census? I think is right. right. It's just like the first one, you could consider the interval from 1900 to 1910. That's the first count of those that would have shown up but didn't. But no, now didn't. they're taken care of. Yeah. And you restart right. again yeah. at the yeah. 1910 exactly. population these, these and go forward did 10 did not show up. Like right. if I add these two together, then we've got over uh, over you know a million people who didn't show up in right. that first census who would but, otherwise have been there. Right, but it's not yeah. double counting because you're exactly. it's a flow and yeah. you're re, you're restarting so at the observed flow. population exactly. of each exactly. 10 years. Wait, 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 wait. I, I, I don't it's not that they didn't show up. If somebody was born in the beginning part of this period yeah. and died a month later after being born, uh, and at a rate higher than for, for, for whites, it's not that they didn't show up five years later when the census was taken. It, you, these, these are, you're not assuming these people would have lived to the point of the end of the period. No, because this is based, because yeah. here, we, we okay, get them here also. We're not assuming nobody dies. We're just assuming that what, what would the survival rate been had, had the no, mortality rate? But it's rate not that showing up at the, at the end of the period is not the critical factor. Mm. It's well, dying during the period. Yes. Well, and earlier right. time, conditional on being yeah. there in the beginning. In the beginning. Dying, dying, dying earlier yeah. in the period yeah. than you would have died if your probability was <coughs> a white person. Yes. Conditional on being there in the in first, the first the place. period before. Yeah. 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 So please ignore the question if you're you have a lot more to present and you're not going to get to it, but um, another way to do this would be to weight each, uh, each early death by the remaining life expectancy of that person who's dying. And then the death 30 seconds after birth is going to account for a huge hit and the person who dies at 74 instead mm -hmm. of 75. But would you weight it by the African American life expectancy or, is the, it white, the, or the white life expectancy? Uh, that's a good question, but uh, let's see. It would well, just depend well, on how you state how your what? counterfactual and what you think is the interesting question. If and our I'm not counterfactual sure. is we've achieved racial equality in socioeconomic status and access to resources. By the white. By the white. Yeah. 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 In which case, I would think that the estimates are going to show about the same gaps because you're actually doing the same counterfactual, you're just adding another weighting scheme to it. It might be the gaps would look bigger earlier in the century and smaller mm -hmm. later. I'm not, I don't really have any intuition about it, except I imagine that there's a whole lot more difference in infant mortality early on. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And get weighted there more is, heavily. And we do show some of the, the let me get yeah. to. Yeah. So anyway, right, but, uh, yeah, please go on. Because there is a difference, but the gaps, you know, so yes, I, I think that's a really good idea, and I think that could give a different, a different thing, a different sort of relative magnitude across the century. I'm not sure I buy it as any more reliable estimate of the gap in something like the experience of death in a population, the loss of life to a population. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me go on. So there's the the cumulative count, but we. We tried to get through that one. <laughs> now, so just briefly, so um, the um, the experience of excess death was much greater for um, women than for men throughout the century. If we aggregate across the century, then the the percentage of all deaths that were excess for ma males was 38 percent. The percentage of excess deaths amongst black females was 45 percent when we aggregate across the full um, the full decade. Of course, the, um, the the gap here, the red bars are females and the black bars are, or sorry, the blue bars are males. So there's very small racial gap in the beginning of the century, but from every every time period except the very last decade, um, the excess death percentage of deaths that are excess is greater amongst females than it is amongst males, and the gaps, the gender gaps, are especially great during the middle part. Of of the century, although the, the, um, the quantity of excess death is much greater in the first part of the century. Now, excess death also is unequally distributed by age group, and so this very messy chart shows you the percentage of deaths that were excess by age group for African Americans, age 0 to 79. Um, and so we have all these age groups, so I'm going I'm to simplify this for you and summarize this by saying that over the century, the age groups between 20 and 59, and especially those aged 20 to 49, experience the highest percentage of excess deaths. So the percentages of all deaths that were excess were greatest amongst the, these um, groups who were in the middle of their life course. 
So these are among um, adults in the prime years of their life course when they are making real significant investments in themselves and their families and becoming the established key economic and social anchors of their families and of their communities. So um, I'm going to just skip over details on this in the, in the um, interest of time. The youngest age groups experience moderate rates of or percentages of excess deaths. Um, and the age groups for um, the youngest age group that we're showing here, 0 to 9 year olds and 10 to 19 year olds, they show um, their star crossed crossing um, different trends um, for, for these two groups. So the, the um, zero to, or 10 to 19 year olds had the highest rates of excess death, the highest percentages of excess death early in the century, but that declined for them and then popped back up at the end of the century. Whereas those who are the youngest age group, the zero to nine year olds, had um, a lower level of excess death at the start of the century. So this is showing that um, infant mortality and childhood mortality is high for everyone. The gap isn't as great here. Um, but then it's, um, it, it fluctuates around, but in general, there's an upward trend there. So that an increasing percentage of all deaths to this youngest age group is excess for African Americans <coughs> um, throughout the century. These are percentage. Different. These are percentage. These are the, I'm tracking the percentage. The percentage time. of deaths that were excess. They were excess across time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is a ratio. So, um, and then here's the oldest age group, 60, the, the um, percentage of all deaths that are excess for those age 60 to 69 is relatively constant at about 30%. Um, but for the oldest age group that, that we're tracking, 70 to 79 year olds, the rate is low. Um, the percentage of excess death is low at the start of the century, but then it increases. So we think that some of this, the low uh, percentages here is due to age, could be attributed to age misreporting amongst the African American population at this age group. Um, but we do see a, a significant uh, an increase over time here. Okay. So, yeah, let me let me just make you could line up in five minutes, then we'll be able to sure. there's lots of discussion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me just try to contextualize this a little bit by um, giving you this um, would you rather go to just the let me just go to the to the projection. Yeah. But I'm gonna just show this yeah. just really quickly. So this is the total observed African American deaths. Um, and the um, estimated African American deaths assuming white mortality. So it's those counts of deaths, both the observed and that assuming white mortality rates, as a percentage of the everborn population. So this, the aim here is to try to contextualize just what is the experience of these counts of death within a particular population. And so um, this is, and I also want to point out that this red bar, which is that, um, that count of deaths assuming whites mortality rates as a percentage of the everborn African American population. This also reflects the experience of death amongst the living population for the whites. So really the heights of these bars and the disparity between them shows a difference in the experience of death in one's family, in one's um, neighborhood, in one's social networks, in one's community. And so the, um, the uh, so I want to point out that here in the early part of the century, the um, experience of death, about 18% of the everborn population died during that first decade amongst African Americans. That was the experience. So about 20, almost you know, a fifth of the full po of the population died during that time period versus about 10% for the, uh, the white population or what would have been experienced if blacks enjoyed the death rates of whites. When you say everborn, you mean live at the beginning? Not yes. at the beginning of the like end. It to the end. Of yeah. The yeah. And so that so that's a pretty huge difference in the experience of death in one's community, in one's family, in one's social networks. Um, the disparity here is this this bar this bar, sorry, is about 77% higher than this one. So the experience of death is about 77% higher in the African American population. This graph shows that definitely we, we have seen an increase in life expectancy, increase in, in outcomes, increase in survival for both populations. But this gap remains, it, it varies between 64% and 94%. So the experience of death throughout the century in the African American population is between 64% and 94% greater than it is in the white population throughout the, that century. Okay, so that, I'm gonna try to get through this. Um, so, <laughs> So what are the impact yeah. of population growth? Yeah, so the last part of our analysis uh, shows how large, or what is the impact of this excess death on population growth. 
So this is where we actually do do a real counterfactual simulation analysis. We are definitely adding people here, okay? So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, if we start out the, this is the observed population in this line right here. If we start out the, in 1900 with the observed African American population, and we age, and we let population projection just move them forward with their observed African American death rates, birth rates, and, and immigration, then this is the trajectory that, that we find, right? Then what if we, the counterfactual is, what if mortality were equal for African Americans and whites? What would the what would the growth pattern look like? And so that's what we have here. So the disparity here, this, if we added up this area, this would be the impact. Both this is missing. This is the missing population, right? Here's what's observed, here's what it would have been. This includes both those individuals who were born and died, those tangible direct deaths, they died prematurely. But it also includes the indirect effect of the loss of life in that population, given that it includes all of those individuals who would have been born but weren't because their would-be parents died before they could actually reproduce. So that's why we're getting that's how we're getting at this impact of the, um, the excess death on mortality. Both that direct effect, people lived. They were born, but then they died prematurely, so they're not there in the population the next, at the next accounting, right? But it's also trying to get at what is that indirect effect of this rate of mortality, really high rates of mortality in this population. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, were, the, were the fertility rates also adjusted? Okay, next slide. <laughs> next, slide. <laughs> next slide. Okay, so of course, this is not, this is only part of the story when we're thinking about population growth. So we know that had there been um, equal, we know a number of things. One thing that we know as demographers is that mortality and fertility rates are connected. They are highly correlated. There is this process by which mortality declines, followed by um, fertility declines or some, some correlation or causation going on there. The other thing that we know is that if our counterfactual really is there's equal socioeconomic equality between, between African Americans and whites. This is also likely to change the fertility rates. Now we don't know, since we don't know what the, um, what the desired family size is amongst African Americans in, an, in the United States where there is racial equality, that we don't have a good way of estimating here's what those rates would look like. So to simplify things as we've done all the way along, we assume the fertility rates of blacks would equal those of whites. And when we do that, Here's what the, the population growth looks like, all right? And so this is if we had equal, if the mortality rates and the fertility rates of, white, of blacks equal those of whites, then we would see population growth that is slightly ahead of what was observed for the first half of the century, but then, or the first two-thirds of the century, but then falls behind what was actually observed. So it's relatively a little bit surprising, right, that we would see this, um, this counterfactual. Now, um, we would also like to do this for immigration. That's another big part of population growth. But um, we don't do that simulation for a number of reasons. Number one, the baseline, if we were to assume that um, the immigration rates of, of blacks equal those of whites, those counts for whites are not themselves not that reliable for the early part of the century. Um, the other thing is there's so much that goes into, just this, so much that goes into fertility, but there's so much that goes into immigration counts. And so many of those variables are so different between um, white populations, those identified as whites, and source of white immigration, and blacks, and, and sources of black immigration. So we don't do that analysis, and I'm um, happy to hear your feedback on that. Um, I'll end by saying, you know, there's this politically sensitive um, uh, racial um, ratio, the black-white ratio in the population. So just to finish out, I'll just illustrate what the um, impact of our projections are for that politically sensitive black-white population ratio from 1900 to 2000. So here's what the observed is. We start out the, the century with a ratio of about 0.13. That drops to 0.11 as about 1930. It takes another, another couple of decades to climb back up to where it was at the start of the century, but ends at, um, accelerates and ends the century at 0.17. Here's what it would look like if we had equal mortality rates between blacks and whites. Of course, the um, African American population would grow more rapidly in relation to the um, white population if the mortality rates were the only thing that changed. But um, the, if we change both, or if we equalize both mortality and fertility rates, then the population ratio, um, somewhat surprisingly perhaps, starts out moving ahead of what was actually observed. But again, half, uh, two thirds of the way through the century, 
the um, black population he would end up growing at a relative at a slower rate relative to the white population and the relative size of these two populations the black population would be smaller in relation to the white population by the end of the century than was what what was observed and I will stop there and we're not going to try this to is, do anything this is, I'm not, I wasn't because yeah. I'm not going to say yeah. that just one thing I want to say the overall death, the excess death count in the 20th century for African Americans 7.7 .7 African American, excess African Americans died. If you think about what that number means, just to put it in context, in the middle of the century, the observed black population size was about 16.2 million. So that number is almost equivalent to half of the observed black population in the middle of the century. It's a huge number. But these people are all just dying, like one at a time here and there. If, it was, if there was a Holocaust, we say quite freely, oh, six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. They all would have died sometime. Some of them were killed as babies. Some of them were killed as older people. But they're all considered, they're basically excess deaths of Jews due to the Holocaust. We can see it very clearly when there's a deliberate action that was taken to exterminate people. But when those deaths result as an um, as a, um, incidental side effect or a byproduct of a system of racial exploitation, it's much harder to, to get our heads around it. So that's all I want to say. Yeah. We're going to have time for discussion, but I just, we, last semester we got in the bad habit of not giving people at 1 o'clock a chance to leave, because some people have one to courses. So I want to give people at 1 o'clock a chance to leave, because we officially end. No one is taking the offer. Stay. <laughs> and now we can do our discussion. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> oh, by the way, is anybody, I just want to say, if anybody does have to leave, um, we need to go back to the title. It's got our yeah. emails on it. If anyone got emails, comments, we're very eager to have comments. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, so, on the births question, in that last graph, it's like <laughs> far behind. Okay. But is this part of the reason we see that crossover because in the earlier period, people are gone, there's excess mortality before childbearing ages are complete, and in the latter period, there's less excess mortality in those ages, but more exposure to low fertility rates? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was playing with slides too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> could you repeat that? So in the, in the yeah. first part of the period, are we seeing that the line is above because we would have saved deaths to women in childbearing ages? Yes. In the latter part yes. of the period, that, because yeah. we're, not we're, not seeing, we're not saving those deaths, but we're seeing lower fertility rates? Yes, right. yes. And then also on birth, births, does, it, does doing that a similar adjustment to it assume white fertility rates in your calculations of just numbers of excess deaths change that story? Oh at all as well, in that it would change the number of people exposed to death at the beginning of the next period. Yeah, that's if you true, assume it people would have less fertility rates to to match lower mortality rates. And how does that change the story? You can do that. Well, no, the, well, you do actually, most of the time, um, blacks didn't have lower fertility rates. There was a brief period in the 20s, I think, of teens, the 20s, and maybe the early 30s, when um, the, the fertility rate of blacks did go down, I think it was an unusual situation, the particular diseases that they were prone to actually bring a lot of black women sterile. Right, I, well, I guess my assumption was that blacks had higher fertility rates. That they were high fertility rates. And now, I'm, I'm saying, what, yeah. shouldn't we also adjust those down, just if we, if we are adjusting mortality down? We right. Think like, okay, so we would have to change the, the baseline, the denominator, yeah, the traits, you right. know, account for mortality in those rates. <laughs> yeah. No, we count for a different mortality. Yeah. 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 To, in the in the calculation. And then you're applying the mortality, low mortality rates for smaller population. I don't know. That seems. That's what you do here. Essentially. Yeah, but you're saying adjust the rate itself. I'm saying adjust the birth rates. Just as you adjust the mortality rates, if these things are linked. It should be it should go along with the counterfactual. No, but it's, we just what we're trying to do is measure the reality that happened. How many extra people died? I know, but what I'm saying is the number of people changes if the birth rates. Yes, it would, but the birth rate was what it was. Yeah, but the mortality rate was what it was also. I thought that's the mortality rate. Yeah. 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 So shouldn't you so also take the birth rate? Yeah, we no, equalized the birth rate. Wait, I think I'm, I think I'm either I'm completely okay. misunderstanding or I read okay. something else into okay. your statement. So let me just repeat what we did. So this, this is... So not not yeah. in, the, in, the, in the number of calculations. Okay. In the first part oh, of the paper. Oh, just the number of excess deaths. Okay. Yeah, the number of excess deaths, aren't you? Go. You're keeping the For, black yes. natality birth rates as they were. Yes. And I'm yes. saying maybe you want to use white birth rates because if you're using white mortality right. rates and there's a connection, okay. then right. perhaps yes. you want to yes. adjust so both that would, Yes, so that would reduce the number of excess deaths. It would provide another counterfactual that, that or it would yeah. provide an application of this counterfactual that we otherwise don't apply until the end of the yeah. analysis. But you do it to this end, part here. Okay. Yeah. Do it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying, if that, that seems like something you're saying naturally follows from lower mortality. 
So let's right. actually see what it looks like, because if this story is in raw numbers and not in rates, then it, it's going to change your story. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ron? Well, one puzzle for me in this is that uh, we see, say, those percents and the numbers looking roughly the same at the beginning yeah. and the end of the century. Yeah. And as I think about that, um, assuming the, the relative population sizes are roughly the same also, I think, um, if there's a constant proportional difference between uh, age specific death rates. Right. When life expectancy is generally low, that leads to a big difference in life expectancies. When life expectancy is generally high, the same ratio of death rates leads to a very small difference in life expectancies. And that's what I expect is going on here, so that the ratio of death rates at the end may be just as high as the ratio of death rates at the beginning. Uh, and therefore, the ratio in numbers of deaths that get counted as excess or not mm -hmm. is about the same at the end rather than the beginning, even though the life expectancies are very close at the end and very distant at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That might yeah. be, anyway, I find that yeah. sort of puzzling and... Well, I mean, population size is also a lot, just the number right. of deaths. Yeah, so the population is, size is a lot bigger at the end of the century. Uh, well, that's true. Yeah. Okay, well, there's, there's the, yeah, that's right. But the percent... There's countervailing yeah. things going on underneath the heights of the bars here, right? Yeah. So at the beginning, we've got higher death rates and bigger and a bigger racial gap in life expectancy. At the end, we've got a smaller gap, but bigger populations on which those rates are actually Right, but applied. the percents are the same. Right, the percents yeah. are the same, and that's a difference. So this, we're trying to give all these different ways of sort yeah. of trying to get a handle on what this means in terms of size. And going back to um, the question at the beginning about why not just use these life expect, why not use our first graph and say, there's a racial gap, it continues. I, I second Mary that like, does that give a sufficient sense of the of what this means? I feel like we've become so just numb to we see this right they're reported every year, yeah. right? CDC, we see them, the gap changes. It's actually it's now declining. Interestingly, right? The racial gap's declining, New York Times headline articles, um, but it's because the rates are, it's for a bad reason, right? The, the um, death rates for whites is, is going up. Good news, smaller, <laughs> smaller gaps in, in, in uh, smaller racial gaps, but the cost in terms of life is high. It's high, and it's increasing. It's going the wrong direction, right? So I think we need these, these different types of measures, and I would argue from the sociologist, I'm a demographer, trained as a demographer, identify as a sociologist, <laughs> and, um, but the, um, you, know, this, you know, there's a huge movement right now, the Black Lives Matter movement, the counting up of, of deaths due to police, um, police shootings and the racial disparities in there. These are visible deaths. We're seeing them on dash cam footage and all that. These are visible deaths. These deaths are, are invisible but account for the huge the huge disparities in, um, and, and we argue reflect those huge disparities in life chances and, and socioeconomic standing that are persistent in this society. So we're using these demographic methods to try to bring more attention to this more sociological. Let's, let's try to get a couple more hands up, a couple more questions. I think Claude was first. Well, since the motivation of this paper is basically rhetorical, <laughs> right? I think it was very clear in your presentation. You want to make vivid. I just want to raise a couple questions of whether it serves its rhetorical purpose. One is the extent to which you can get picked apart on this stuff. And I think the sense of the demographers in the room is that life years of life year life years is really a much more accurate measure, for instance. I mean, the extent to which this gets picked apart, well, let me imagine this goes out viral. It won't be ten seconds before people will be picking this apart, just like the case Steeton paper on excess white mortality. I mean, I had somebody ask me to write a column on it. I said, let me wait a couple weeks till all the dust settles. Right. <laughs> and the dust still hasn't settled. So that's one problem, I think, is that you will get picked apart. The other is the labeling. Here's another example where I worry this is backfire. What if I did the same paper and I talked about male-female differences and the excess male mortality? And this, and I, just, I use the word excess male mortality as a documentation of the uh, discriminatory conditions males face in this country. This is basically what you're doing. Is there's no, nothing behind it. You haven't decomposed the deaths, for example, into deaths by different kinds of conditions. Uh, 
whether they're congenital birth defect deaths or whether they're deaths by violence or whether they're deaths by infection. You've just presented the idea that the word excess means that there's a social problem here. Well, I could do that with male female, and I could you run could, it. But it wouldn't you make would go the other way. Why, so would not make, why would not make sense? Because um, my, females are not oppressing males. We, we, we know. Oh, but, 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 wait, but you're using this to prove that there's oppression, and I not you, yet. Give us a chance. All right. <laughs> All right, I don't want to get into argument. I just want to point out that I'm worried that even at, 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 just as a rhetorical device, yeah. it actually is counterproductive. Not... On that note. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, really, we really must stop, but there's, uh, we can continue informal discussion. So uh, thank you so much for. <laughs>